So welcome once again to our Oxford Brain Diagnostics guest speaker series. Um, by way of introduction to OBD, um, we're an Oxford University spin out with a method for analysing brain MRI based on cellular structures. Uh, we're working towards a clinical tool for early detection of Alzheimer's disease um, and other neurodegenerative diseases for use clinically and in um, drug trials. Um, we're joined today by Professor Henrik Zetterberg. Um, he's renowned for his work on fluid biomarkers uh, for neurodegenerative diseases. He's published more than a thousand articles and has been the recipient of many awards. Um, he leads the Fluid Biomarkers for Neurodegenerative Diseases group at the UK Dementia Research Institute at UCL. Um, and he's the head of Department of Psychiatry and Neurochemistry at the University of Gothenburg, where he co-leads with Kai Blano, the Neurochemical Pathophysiology and Diagnostics group. And he's also a clinical chemist at Salgransky University Hospital. Um, as an imaging based company, we look forward to a discussion about how imaging biomarkers and fluid biomarkers um, can complement each other. Um, OK, Henrik, over to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for that introduction also. Um, so I will give you a little bit of an update now on the blood based biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease and related neurodegenerative diseases. So this is the first slide. Uh, I have developed this slide deck together with Nick Ashton in my team here. So I should be uh, duly acknowledged also. And we have tried to put together slides that give uh, sort of the latest um, state of this research, both from uh, data produced by our group, but also in relation to what other, others have produced lately in this field. And I would like to start with this slide, which sort of illustrates the blood biomarker discovery work that has been going on uh, over almost 20 years and now accelerated a lot during the past five or to 10 years. And one could really ask, what, what is the reason for the progress? And if one looks before 2006, these types of biomarkers in blood were identified as related to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And if you look at the identity of these proteins, these are relatively highly abundant proteins in plasma. They are not directly related to any of the brain changes that we use to define uh, Alzheimer's disease or other neurodegenerative diseases, except for some apolipoproteins and also some markers that are related to inflammation. But the connection between uh, this group of biomarkers and brain changes is relatively loose. But in discovery studies before 2006, uh, you can see that many papers were published and these markers are relatively highly correlated with each other. But they represent sort of a class of biomarkers that had limited diagnostic performance, it turned out. So, so people were actually worried in the field that blood biomarkers would never really work to detect Alzheimer's disease. In parallel with this work, a lot of biomarker development work happened in, um, in uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And the biomarkers identified in cerebrospinal fluid are summarized in the lower left here. And eventually, with improved analytical sensitivity of the measurement technologies, we could start to measure them in blood as well. And then this, became, this has become uh, the, 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 the re recent and very intense research field indicating that it's actually possible to pinpoint amyloid, tau and neurodegeneration pathologies in blood in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so, so this is sort of the, 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 the class of biomarkers I will from here on uh, focus on. So one could ask then, what come that, that, that this has been uh, such um, a relatively uh, productive field? Uh, and that is uh, the first reason, which is to me relatively obvious, is that we have the technological advancements. Uh, one technology that has proven uh, particularly useful is single molecule array technology. Uh, there is a scheme, uh, a simplified scheme of how this uh, technology works. It's basically a sandwich immunoassay. It works almost exactly like a sandwich immunoassay, but the, the um, um, detection reaction is compartmentalized in micro wells, which makes it possible to count single molecules. And this is really the basic um, innovation that this technology brought. This molecule counting made it possible to make the assays extremely sensitive. Um, there is also a way of capturing an analogous signal, which makes it the, the dynamic range of the assay very broad. So, so it's not, there's no problem with high concentrations if most of, of these micro wells are emitting fluorescence because of pressure, presence of analyte. But it, so you can have both very high analytical sensitivity and ve a very broad dynamic range. 
and there have also been there has also been developments uh, in high resolution mass spectrometry and there is also improvements in the classical clinical chemistry uh, immunoassay formats where the instruments are fully automated and where antibodies are used to quantify biomarkers. So technological advancements, that's one big uh, reason for the, the relative success during recent years in uh, Alzheimer's blood biomarkers. Uh, then one could also uh, ask, uh, is there anything else that has happened? Well, the cohorts of patients we are examining are nowadays much better characterized in regards to their molecular pathologies than they used to be before 2005. And so, so now most of the discovery cohorts we are trying to use to discover blood-based biomarkers, they, there the patients have undergone imaging and or CSF-based biomarker characterization to determine if the patients have amyloid pathology, tau pathology, and or neurodegeneration. So when we are uh, trying now to develop novel biomarkers or validate existing biomarkers, we can do it in relationship to these gold standard measurement tools uh, or measurement results of Alzheimer's pathology, which are uh, that are almost as good as neuropathology. So the uh, PET tracers uh, for amyloid and tau, they have been validated against neuropathology. We can now examine patients that have who have undergone amyloid PET imaging, and then we can see if blood biomarkers can differentiate amyloid positive from negative people. And we can also check if the new biomarkers relate to the amount of tau pathology and neurodegeneration. So this is uh, the second reason for why this has become such, uh, why it has become uh, easier to develop and validate uh, blood biomarkers. Then we also have a much improved molecular understanding of the proteins we are trying to measure. So for example, for tau, which is depicted here, um, the upper part here you see the full length tau molecule uh, that we can detect in brain tissue. In CSF, we now know, thanks to a lot of work by people like uh, Randy Bateman and his team members, that, that uh, when we measure CSF, tau, we measure an N-terminal fragment that doesn't contain much of the C-terminal parts. And in blood, it's even more clear that we need to focus on N-terminal parts if we want to detect the molecule. So assays that, that need uh, both um, the N-terminus and the very C-terminal part of tau, they will not work in blood. And that is something we now know. And this is relevant also for many of the other uh, proteins we are trying to measure. We now know, for example, that neurofilament light also in blood is a fragment and it doesn't contain the N and C-terminal parts. But if you want to measure it reliably in blood, you have to go for the core mid-domain of the protein. So I would say these are the three main reasons for why, why it has, why, why we have uh, seen uh, such a relative success now in many studies detecting Alzheimer's disease in, in blood. We have a number of uh, targeted biomarkers that we can measure in biofluids now. This is uh, Oscar Hansson's nice um, uh, review paper that was published this year in Nature Medicine, where he sort of summarizes the whole field. So we have a beta 42 to 40 in CSF, a ratio in CSF and plasma as an, a plaque pathology test. We, of course, have amyloid PET also that, that works really well to detect um, uh, the, the amyloid plaque pathology in Alzheimer's disease. We have phosphorylated forms of tau in CSF and plasma that relate to tangle pathology, uh, not directly, but it, uh, these markers are predictive of tangle pathology, as I will show you in uh, upcoming slides. And we can measure the tangle pathology in the tissue with PET. Uh, and then we have neurofilament light as a neurodegeneration uh, marker in both CSF and plasma. And these, uh, this marker really correlates relatively well with um, magnetic resonance imaging of neurodegeneration. And then we have a number of other markers that relate to synaptic uh, pathology, both presynaptic and postsynaptic pathology. And some astrocytic and microglial markers. Uh, GFAP is one of the, glial fibrillar acidic protein is one of the most promising ones. Uh, and um, just during the past few years, it's, it's become clear that levy body pathology can actually be monitored in cerebrospinal fluid with a seed amplification assay, which, which really seems to be a nice qualitative test to determine whether the patient has levy body pathology or not. So this is sort of the summary of what biomarkers we have available now that are relevant to different neurodegenerative diseases in biofluids. And then I also highlighted some of the imaging um, 
markers that that we have so much had so much use of in fluid biomarker development projects to validate our findings um, against these measures of, of neuropathology. So phosphorylated tau has really become the, the, the molecule that, that is mo has been most in focus uh, during the past few years in the blood biomarker field. And phosphorylated tau is, of course, uh, it's a uh, hyperphosphorylation of tau is really a central pathology in Alzheimer's disease. And if we think about neurofilament light and GFAP, they are uh, not uh, as specific for Alzheimer's disease as phosphorylated tau. So neurofilament light is a general marker of neurodegeneration and GFAP is a marker of astrocytic activation. Both of these um, pathologies or pathological processes happen in Alzheimer's disease, but they, they are not specific. Which, but p -tau is. So if one looks here uh, at uh, neurofilament light results, uh, this is just one example of a neurofilament light study. Plasma neurofilament light on the y-axis and a lot of different diseases on the x-axis. Then you see that a diseases like ALS, Down syndrome with Alzheimer's disease pathology, frontotemporal dementia, they are really elevated in neurofilament light. One also sees this in a beta positive individuals, but the level is much uh, less increase un increased until the patient uh, starts to develop neurodegenerative disease. So neurofilament light is a general neurodegeneration marker, not specific to the disease process. When cognitive impairment starts to happen, then, then you, when you are in the clinical stage of the disease, then, then uh, the plasma NFL levels will, will start to increase. But phosphorylated tau uh, uh, as a marker of Alzheimer's pathology starts already in the preclinical uh, phase of the disease, as I will show you soon here. Uh, these are data on glial fibrillar acidic protein. This is a marker. We think it's a marker of reactive astrogliosis. Uh, and we can see here that plasma GFAP levels, they start to increase in people when amyloid pathology starts to appear, amyloid pathology by PET or CSFA beta 42 40 ratio, which is sort of a very concordant measure of amyloid pathology, concordant with PET. And then when the disease gets worse, uh, gets worse, then uh, the levels increase further. Uh, but if one measures GFAP in traumatic brain injury or stroke or in frontotemporal dementia, GFAP will increase in those conditions as well. So it's not a specific marker, but it's very clear that GFAP increase happens quite rapidly when you get amyloid pathology on the brain. So it's actually a marker that reflects amyloid pathology, but it's not specific for amyloid pathology. Total tau uh, is a marker in cerebrospinal fluid that also works to detect Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but in blood, which is the x-axis here, uh, the, the levels do not correlate with CSF. And we see that there are no meaningful increases in Alzheimer's disease in blood for, uh, for um, uh, plasma total tau in, in this graph here, whereas phosphorylated tau increases like this. Um, there are some novel assays for CNS-specific forms of tau that I won't talk about here, but that start to look a little bit promising. But it's very clear that total tau, when you measure it in blood, most likely is also, that measure is sort of contaminated with peripheral tau from peripheral nerves that do not relate to the neurodegenerative process one would like to detect in the brain. Uh, so uh, again, phospho tau is much better in blood than total tau. Then one could ask, how about amyloid in blood? So it's possible to measure amyloid peptides in blood, but APP expression and amyloidogenic APP processing is not specific to the brain. It happens in the liver, it happens in myocytes and in some other compartments in, in, in the body. And it appears like 80 to 90% of the blood signal comes from uh, peripheral tissues. So when you start to get amyloid deposition in, in the CNS, then if you look in the B panel here, then the A beta 42 uh, amount in CSF will be reduced. A beta 40, will not, which is more water soluble, will not be reduced that much. And then when you have amyloid PET positive people, they are lower in the CSF. And, and that is uh, uh, really a um, quite strong decrease like this. It's a 50% reduction with a relatively small overlap uh, between amyloid PET negative and PET positive people. 
longitudinal studies indicate that these people tend to move over to the amyloid PET positive group. And it really looks like people where in the earliest sign of amyloid deposition in the brain is that CSFA beta 4 to ratio drops, and then eventually you become PET positive. This graph is cross-sectional data, so I shouldn't, I should highlight that, but other studies indicate that, that this is happening. If you look in, in plasma, there is also a reduction in amyloid PET positive individuals. But if you look at the y-axis here, you see it's broken and the percent reduction is around 10, 12 percent and the overlap is larger. So the blood test is not as clear as the, as the CSF test. But it works reproducibly if you have uh, the possibility of doing batch-wise analysis of plasma beta 42 40 ratio. And then you will see this type of reduction. And the AUC in this graph is actually almost 0.9. So it's not a bad test, but it's a difficult test to maintain stable over time in clinical chemistry practice. Because if you have the slightest drift in your assay, a lot of people will move across the threshold for, for technical reasons rather than, than um, real uh, reasons in the brain. And just to highlight this a little bit further, this is uh, a histogram of what the A-beta 4240 ratios look like. You see that there are two populations, one that is PET positive here and PET negative in the other one. And you see that th there is a clear difference, but it is a small difference and uh, there is a big overlap. So this is basically the challenge with A-beta 4240 ratio. And then one could ask, what about plasma phospho tau? Well, here you see that the fold change is much higher. There is an overlap, but the overlap is smaller. So here you see that the mean fold change in A-beta 4240 ratio is 0.6% in this study. The mean fold change in amyloid PET positive people um, in, for phospho tau 231 is uh, an increase of 85% in this case. So it's a little bit of a an easier uh, marker to to uh, to use in 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 um, uh, clinical practice, although it's not perfect. Uh, that's important to remember too. Uh, Phosphor tau levels in blood uh, they reflect Alzheimer's pathology. That has this has been shown by several research groups, uh, but I wanted to show this study which we conducted together with King's College in London, and this was a very forward-looking uh, study where patients during a long time gave plasma samples and then also participated in a brain donation program. So they gave plasma samples when they were alive and then eventually they donated their brains. And then we could look at uh, different time points of plasma collection, uh, approximately eight, four and two years prior to death. These are not, it's not a real longitudinal studies, but the, the, the samples could be, uh, could be collected like this. And then we could see that plasma phosphotal 181 levels were increased in patients that had uh, neuropathological, uh, neuropathologically verified Alzheimer's pathology like this. People with levy border dementia, they, they had a little bit perhaps of a trend of an increase, but frontotemporal dementia and uh, CAA and other topathies like this, they looked like controls. So this, these data, together with other data from Lord Galasco and, and Eric Raymond and other researchers, show that the plasma phosphotal biomarkers, they, they uh, predict Alzheimer's. Uh, pathology. And these data uh, that I show here are actually eight years prior to post-mortem analysis. So, so the biomarker, uh, the, the plasma phosphotal levels have been validated against neuropathology, which is good. Um, it, if we look across the disease continuum uh, in Alzheimer's disease, moving from preclinical amyloid positive people towards people with mild cognitive impairment with amyloid and then eventually with Alzheimer's disease dementia. It looks like this. So frontotemporal dementia is normal, very normal, much like young, young uh, adults here. A beta negative older adults have slightly increased levels, but not uh, much. A beta positive older levels, they uh, have uh, elevated levels here. A beta negative MCI patients, they are not r really further increased. But then when you have MCI and Alzheimer's, then you get then you get the, the, the strong phosphotau increases like this. And in this case, it's the 181 isoform. And in this part of the panel, you see also that this is again Alzheimer specific and not seen in Parkinson's disease or PSP or CBD or such uh, diseases.
here are a couple of other studies that also came uh, 2020 showing essentially the same thing. So up here you see the study by Elizabeth Tyson, uh, where you see healthy controls, MCI patients and all Alzheimer's disease patients and all these other neurodegenerative diseases being healthy control like. So the phosphotau biomarker pinpoints Alzheimer's disease already in um, in the MCI stage. And this graph also shows from, from um, Shurin Ajan and Lids's paper here, show that as soon as you have a little bit of uh, amyloid pathology, you, you get an increase in phosphotau levels. And the more uh, amyloid pathology by, by PET, the more um, the higher the phosphotau concentration. Then one could uh, ask how this might work if one if one uh, would like to do this in 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 clinical practice, could these plasma tests replace the CSF, for example? Uh, could they could they be used uh, instead of PET? And then one can actually see here that phosphata 181, uh, the Janssen 217 assay, Lily uh, 181 by ADX, uh, 217 by Janssen, 181 by Lily, and 217 by Lily, and some other assays here, they reach AUCs of around 0.9, and some are even higher. So it starts to look like these blood tests are approaching the, the diagnostic performance as we see for CSF tests, for example. Um, and because here you see also the CSF uh, biomarker results and it's not looking bad. So it, um, it might be that we eventually will see that we might not need uh, CSF uh, to confirm uh, these findings. I think most clinicians and clinical researchers uh, will want at, the, at this stage to confirm blood test results with CSF or PET imaging. Uh, but then uh, I, this really indicates that in the future we might um, uh, have enough confidence in these blood tests to be able to use them in isolation and at least identify clearly abnormal and clearly, clearly normal people and uh, making decisions um, in regards to diagnosis together with the clinical evaluation and other um, uh, additional measures to, to classify people in the absence of, of uh, CSF tests. And another important part here is that it's not a thing, you don't have to pick one phosphotau, one uh, phosphoform of tau. You, you can actually see that uh, some of the different assays give you very high uh, analyst, uh, diagnostic performance. And that, and, and I, as a clinical chemist, I think that is good because it's always good with a little bit of competition between assay vendors. Uh, this is a suggestion for how we could use these blood tests in clinical practice or in clinical trials. So we would, I mean, in clinical practice, one would really, then people are, of course, ask for medical advice when they start to get symptoms. Uh, it might be the patient themselves or uh, a relative of the patient says that something is going on here. Then one could think of actually doing uh, this type of blood test. And then one could classify or risk stratify the patient into high probability for Alzheimer's disease and low probability. And perhaps these more extreme values where the results are clear cut and far away from the cut point could be enough to make a biomarker support the clinical decision. Both high probability, where one could say that, okay, this patient should uh, probably get uh, an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis if the clinical workup um, also suggest that this patient could be eligible for anti-beta therapies uh, and one could also, if needed, start to, to uh, treat the patient with sym currently available symptomatic treatments. If it's not, um, if it's very low probability, then as a clinician, one would want to examine the patient for non-Alzheimer's neurodegenerative dementias and then also consider if those examinations are negative, uh, depression and non-neurodegenerative causes for uh, the symptoms. And then we have this intermediate group, perhaps this is 20 to 30% of the people. They could be uh, referred for PET imaging or um, CSF and additional uh, diagnostic um, uh, examinations to try to get to, to the most likely diagnosis. But uh, what it's becoming quite hopeful now is that these blood biomarkers could help with reducing the number of individuals who need CSF and or PET uh, scanning. And that would of course save a lot of cost. And so, but this is more of a future perspective. But I must say that all data we have seen so far indicates that this, I actually think this is the reality we will see in the next, uh, perhaps in three, four, five years. <laughs>
which would be quite exciting, I think. But to be able to do this, of course, we have to have very stable assays that we can run in clinical chemistry practice uh, week by week on patients coming in and so um, uh, on uh, sort of ad hoc samples coming in from the memory clinics. So um, we need uh, automated high throughput assays that are very stable to be able to do this. Uh, but I think th this is these issues are technical rather than scientific at the moment because the biomarker really seems to, to be able to work. We also, of course, need to check that the biomarkers work well in the presence of comorbidities, and uh, we have to look for uh, confounding factors outside the cohort studies we have been doing, and such. Um, a lot of such studies are ongoing right now. Mm. So if I would start to conclude here now, because we're approaching the 30 minutes here, the plasma phosphatase tests, most of them are ready for cautious clinical implementation. I really think that uh, so. And P-tau reflects AD pathology. It could be useful to exclude frontotemporal dementia, for example. Phosphatase 217 is likely to be perhaps the most useful biomarker. It has been replicated the most, and it often has the highest diagnostic performance. All of the other uh, phosphoforms are also looking quite good. We also need to 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 um, understand that different beta tests might have different diagnostic uh, accuracy. Criti we have to evaluate uh, them uh, critically in research studies, and we have to do real life studies also. And we have just published appropriate use recommendations uh, in this paper that uh, that where you see that the um, PubMed ID here in Alzheimer's and dementia uh, just a few weeks ago. And plasma phosphatase tests, they are definitely ready for enrichment strategies for recruitment into clinical trials. This can save a lot of money, and these blood tests are already used now in most of the large clinical trials of anti-amyloid um, treatments now. Uh, and uh, I could also say that uh, there are data indicating that plasma phosphatase uh, markers can be useful to monitor disease uh, progression in Alzheimer's disease. And perhaps the data are most clear for phosphatase 217 with this stepwise increase. The more advanced the disease gets, the, the higher the, the, the result. And also there are convincing data from some of the anti-amyloid treatment studies now that plasma phosphatase forms actually decrease in response to effective treatment. Um, Plasma phosphatau reflects both amyloid and tau. And the way we look at these biomarkers now from the different results that have been produced in, in a large number of cohorts now, it looks like plasma phosphatau starts to increase relatively immediately when amyloid starts to deposit in the brain. And this probably represents a neuronal reaction to the amyloid plaque pathology. So neurons exposed to plaques will phosphorylate and secrete tau, potentially as part of a pruning um, uh, induction, induced pruning by, by um, the amyloid plaques. And then the, the increase is predictive of neocortical tangle pathology as measured by PET. So neurons that are affected by amyloid will phosphorylate and secrete tau, they will eventually degenerate and develop tangle pathology. But phosphor tau is not the direct marker of tangle pathology when you measure it in, in the biofluids. The most direct biomarker of tangled pathology would then be tau pet. So they are complementary, these, these, uh, these um, uh, markers. We need to examine these uh, markers in uh, relation to comorbidities. Chronic kidney disease has been suggested as a, a, a disease that might increase phosphor tau also in the absence of uh, Alzheimer's pathology. Uh, there is also one study suggesting that ALS, uh, and spe especially some subforms of ALS, have increased. Um, ALS patients can have increased phosphatase levels, and this we do not understand completely. If this is peripheral tau that contributes to this, or, 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 or yeah, this is not known yet, but important to consider. And then we also might need to develop some additional. Uh, the uh, tau biomarkers, because the the mark the phospho tau markers they are not detecting non Alzheimer's tau pathology, but there are some interesting data. And actually, I should have put it in now, but just this week or today, um, uh, Randy Bateman's team published also another study indicating that if you look to C terminal tau with very sensitive assays, then you can start to detect biomarker changes that actually can pinpoint non Alzheimer's tau pathology. 
so that is a very recent study in a uh, paper in Nature Medicine. I actually think it was published today or yesterday. Uh, so uh, with sensitive assays, you can look into the c terminal part of microtubular binding um, uh, domain of tau and eventually get some uh, biomarker evidence for non-Alzheimer's uh, tau pathology. Then one just could ask, well, should one give up on plasma beta 4240 now when I, I showed you this this problem that the fold change was so small because of peripheral a beta I don't think we should do that because a convincing data indicate that a beta 4240 is the first marker to change also in plasma and it is also quite remarkable that this ratio has a, it's very stable within individ, individuals and the analytical variation is very low for A beta 40 and 42, uh, for example, in some of the fully automated assays uh, seen on the Alexis platform by Roche. And I think also Fujirebio has some interesting results on the Lumipulse platform that they can very accurately measure A beta 42 and 40 peptides in the blood. We have also examined together with Oscar Hansson's team the biological variation. And for the ratio, the plasma beta 42 fold ratio, the biological variation is minimal. There is also no influence of gender or demographic factors uh, on the ratio, whereas, for example, phosphotau levels are lower, it seems, both in CSF and in blood in, in um, uh, African-American people and some, uh, so, and, and um, this has been seen in studies both by John Morris and, and some other researchers in the US. And this effect is not present for a beta 4240. So it might be that, that this could be, um, if we just make sure that the assays can be produced stably in a way that they can be that they can be used week by week over years in clinical laboratories, th then perhaps this is a marker that still will have some utility um, in uh, Alzheimer's disease um, diagnostics. So with that, I would like to conclude and I would like to thank all the collaborators and uh, and uh, team members here in Gothenburg and, and London and collaborators all over the world and also patients and relatives who donate samples for these studies and of course funders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henrik. That was a wonderful overview. Um, I really appreciate uh, the, uh, the, the, the insights that you've shared with us. Um, does anyone have any questions? I didn't see any any hands. I'll, I'll maybe start with one myself. Um, so you were, you were just talking about the uh, relative strength of um, AB to 42 to 40. Um, compared to uh, PTAU in terms of um, ethnic and demographic factors. Um, could you comment on the situation for NFL? Oh, yeah. So NFL also has this problem. With, uh, NFL is it's such a, uh, I, I must say, it's almost my favorite biomarker, but uh, but um, but it's uh, it has so many uh, uh, problems as well. So NFL increases in response to any uh, neurodegenerative, uh, neurodegenerative disease and any axonal injury event. So, and then it, and that's, I, I think that is good. And when we developed the first plasma NFL assay, the dream from our side was that this could be a, a readily accessible uh, blood test that one could do whenever there was a suspicion was on any brain process that would injure axons. I was thinking, you know, one dream scenario would be that that someone seeks um, advice in a GP office because of numbness in in a, in in a, a foot or something like that, and then one could think that okay, is there a neurodegenerative process going on here? And then the the, the um, uh, GP would t send in a blood test for NFL. It comes back negative, and then you can give reassuring uh, advice to the patient and uh, and uh, say that at least it's not uh, it's not multiple sclerosis or neurodegenerative disease. But we have seen over the two years we have been analyzing NFL in clinical chemistry routine. We see that this is a marker which can't exclude uh, neurodegeneration. If it's abnormal, one really should examine the patient carefully. But the normal result doesn't exclude neurodegeneration. The full change in uh, when we have had paired CSF and plasma samples, for example, from Huntington disease patients, the full change in CSF is greater and it starts to increase clearly uh, more clearly earlier in in csf than in plasma but the, uh, an elevated nfl concentration in blood is definitely something one needs to act on uh, and examine 
NFL also has an age-related increase that no one really understands, which is a bit of a problem. So in people who are 75 or older, the, the results are very uh, hard to interpret. But in people who are 50, 60 years of age, then it works quite well to say that an elevation, uh, elevated concentration likely indicates a neurodegenerative disease or something else that might injure axons. So, um, and, and then NFL also has the very same problem as um, other biomarkers in regard as, as phosphatau in regards to chronic kidney disease. So if you have chronic kidney disease, NFL levels are increased. It's not it's not by much, but it's like 20, 30 percent or so. Uh, and the reason, I mean, some people have thought that this is because the protein, because of defective clearance of the protein, but proteins are not cleared by the kidneys. It might be something else going on. Uh, but the NFL has expression in peripheral nerves. It has expression a little bit in the kidneys also. So perhaps there is something going on there that one needs to uh, take into account. Uh, and it has not been studied that much in relation to, uh, to cardiovascular disease and other uh, diseases. So more work might be needed uh, there as well. Uh, so I think that we really should look carefully uh, on potential confounders for all of the blood biomarkers we have at hand now and then try to define which other conditions one should be careful with when examining, uh, when using these blood biomarkers. Thank Can you. I, I've, got a, I've got a follow up question on the on the NFL story, if that's OK, Jed. Um, I saw Ian was trying to get into the question as well, but um, uh, before that, um, I was reading, Henrik, a little bit about NFL and that uh, there's, there seems to be some accumulated evidence that uh, there's, a, there's a kind of NFL signal related to inflammatory events, neuroinflammatory events, as if you like, as well as neurodegenerative events. And I know that in some ways that you could say, you could argue it's hard to discriminate them, but, I, but is, is there a sense in which one of those is a great, greater component or contributor to the signal than others or any way to differentiate? What do you think? Yeah, this hypothesis has been uh, generated in the multiple sclerosis field for mm. very good reasons because, uh, so NFL uh, really started to prove useful in multiple sclerosis and especially in relapsing remitting um, MS patients where there was a clear increase in people who had a bout of MS. And then when they were treated and got out of the, uh, of, of the bout, then NFL levels decreased again. And that was really seen uh, quite convincingly in many studies um, uh, from MS researchers in different parts of the world. Um, then, uh, of course, we examined NFL a lot in neurodegeneration contexts. And then we were hopeful that this would be a brilliant marker to also detect um, um, uh, secondary progressive MS and monitor, yeah, monitor different forms of progressive MS. But now we are in a situation where we see that in progressive MS, NFL is not that predictive of, of um, disability. Instead, GFAP comes up over and over as the most predictive marker. So for one reason or another, uh, NFL works better in uh, to in a, this inflammatory form of MS with relapsing, remitting uh, episodes than in, neurodegeneration, in, than in neurodegenerative MS. And we don't understand this completely. Uh, uh, but um, I would still argue that, that most data suggests that, I, I wouldn't call NFL an inflammation biomarker because there are, then I think one should measure the classical inflammatory biomarkers and also astrocytic and um, microglial uh, proteins. I, I still think it mostly reflects axonal injury, but um, perhaps in secondary progressive MS, the, the speed at which axons are injured and or that the axonal degeneration process perhaps is more contained in the tissue somehow in progressive MS than in, in uh, when you have acute relapses. But this is all speculation from my side. Mm. But I would like to mention one thing with neurofilament light that surprised me a lot and that also disturbed me quite a bit, I have to admit. Uh, there are some indications that NFL, when it's released from neurons, it's released as a, as a small multimer of some kind. It seems that it is actually uh, 
proteolytically processed. So most assays that work well, they use antibodies against the core domain of the protein. And it seems to be a dimer or a trimer or something like that, a small oligomer. And that this uh, form of NFL actually is cleared by, to some extent, by microglia. So, so that microglia are involved in, if we, for example, take our calibrator and put that on, uh, our NFL calibrator and put that on um, uh, IPS drive microglia, uh, especially if we have labeled it with fluorescence, then this appears, it, 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 mm. the protein appears inside the microglia. Mm. One could, in a critical, uh, if you have <laughs> this critical mindset, I can say that microglia eat anything. But um, if we also put on CSF on the IPS drive microglia, after 24 to 48 hours, the NFL level is almost gone. Um, so uh, microglia is doing something to NFL turnover. And then we have also done studies in uh, with acute injury or, of uh, IPS-derived cortical neurons. And then we see that if we injure, for example, with irradiation, we get an NFL increase in the medium, just as we expect. But we also get an upregulation of the transcript. So NFL has become a little bit more of a regulate, regulated biomarker than I and we, mm -hmm. than I thought, which is a little bit sad because it makes it more complicated. Mm -hmm. But perhaps it's very bi biologically very, uh, I mean, uh, relevant or or or, uh, it, uh, or uh, well uh, understandable that it could be like this. But uh, two three years ago, I was thinking of NFL as a very passive injury marker, and that the increase we measured uh, in biofluids represented release of passive release of NFL from from axons that were falling apart. Now I think that the concentration we measure might be influenced a little bit by microglial activation, a little bit by transcriptional regulation and synthesis of the protein. And but mostly I still regard the marker as a, an axonal injury marker. But it has become a little bit more complicated, unfortunately. Thanks. Thanks for that very full answer. Yeah, I can see how the different the different aspects of the data you've got sort of contribute to a, 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 an interesting picture, but one where you've got kind of fluctuating levels depending on counterbalancing features, I suppose. Yeah, mm. it's interesting. OK, thanks. I think Mario had a question and Ian. Oh, hello. Um, hello, Professor. Thank you so much for your talk. It was it was fascinating. Um, if uh, if if we if we wanted to set a slightly different challenge and say that the only thing that was important was to find uh, patients who are amyloid positive and tau negative, um, what combination of tests would you use to get the uh, the best accuracy of detecting those individuals? Yes, that's a great question. So the phospho tau markers will not work because they are so responsive to um, amyloid. But it looks like one potentially could use a combination of phosphotau markers. But I, I must say that we need to do more studies on this to confirm that that what, what has been seen is really uh, bi not biologically relevant and not just assay dependent. But it looks like phosphotau-231 increases immediately when amyloid starts to deposit. And then it plateaus. Uh, so it, there is no further increase. And, but now this is super speculative, so I really have to warn everyone listening here. One could think then that a perfect group to include would be phosphotau-231 positive people, but phosphotau-217 negative or 181 negative. And that that small uh, proportion of people you screen for a trial would be likely to be amyloid positive, but not yet have too much tau pathology. But this is super speculative, and I wouldn't um, dare to, to say that this will work or so if anyone would use it a, for recruiting into a clinical trial. Um, there are companies, I mean, the Lilly strategy with Donanumab has been to include amyloid pe positive people who have a little bit of tau pathology, but then they have used the imaging markers to define that. Uh, but I think for the future, that th there are some discussions in the field that one potentially could do something with blood biomarkers um, to achieve this. Another scenario would be uh, if one would be very certain that the amyloid ratio in plasma is accurate, that one would take people who are amyloid positive according to the ratio in blood and then phos plasma phosphotau negative. I mean, that would be the most... Um, 
uh, the, the, that perhaps would make most sense when thinking about uh, the biomarkers. Then I would have sort of a, a positive amyloid marker and a negative tau marker. But the, the caveat there is that you can't use 231 it was also 231 as the tau pathology marker, but perhaps it would work with a combination of A-beta-4240 ratio and phosphotau-181. So a positive A-beta-4240 ratio and negative 181 result, likely these people will be amyloid positive with not that much tau pathology. But all this would need to be uh, confirmed in, in um, studies with imaging evidence of the two. Thank you so much. That's an excellent answer. Thank you. So you see how much imaging and uh, fluids will have to to uh, they, uh, a lot of studies where we use both will be extremely important. And of course, the advantage with the new imaging uh, tools that uh, you and others have uh, developed is that you can do this in vivo. Because otherwise, one could say the most important thing we need to do now is to validate against neuropathology. That is important, but it's not uh, as important as, as it as it was. 10 years ago uh, when we didn't have, uh, when, when there, were, there was such lack of, of um, um, cohorts with good imaging data. Hi Eric, can you hear me? Yes, yes Mario. Uh, thank you for your fantastic presentation. I have another question about a new filament, despite it's not your favorite uh, biomarker. So well, It is my favorite biomarker. It is, <laughs> yes. Okay, but, good. For, uh, but it's more um, um, uh, it's more uh, uh, feelings than uh, than science. Mm. Yeah. So considering what you said, and uh, considering, is, of course, uh, neurofilament is not uh, uh, it's a robust biomarker for of axonal degeneration, but it's not disease specific. It doesn't provide, of course, any information about the pathology distribution. But considering the relatively low cost on neurofilament, do you think that it should be used complementary to imaging, for instance, as a screening test to filter patients for MRI or PET imaging. Yeah, I definitely think so. And actually, we do. We, that's why we sit. We, we have actually validated and the biomarker for clinical use in our laboratory here. So we, we do this in clinical chemistry routine Tuesdays and Thursdays. We measure plasma neurofilament light uh, with uh, a Samoa assay. Uh, so that's so we do that, and we are right. In the now in the process of um, validating for clinical use one of the phosphotau markers, and the way I see it is that in memory clinics one and potentially actually in in uh, primary care, but then one has to uh, be sure to have a good um, uh, link to uh, the specialist clinics to uh, make sure that the data are interpreted in a good way. But having phosphotau and NFL. Together, when you examine a patient with suspected neurodegenerative disease, yeah. uh, perhaps suspected Alzheimer's, that is very, very good because then you are, uh, if you only had measured phosphotau, then you would have missed the other non Alzheimer's neurodegenerative diseases. And yeah. if you measure phosphotau and neurofilament light, you will get a complete separation of patients with Alzheimer's and frontotemporal dementia. And you wouldn't miss the frontotemporal dementia if you also measure neurofilament light. Uh, because that's really one of the neurodegenerative dimensions where NFL is increased in, in a quite robust manner. The protein as such in, 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 in blood is super stable. You, you, can, you can leave the protein uh, at the bench for two weeks without uh, having any problems with losing uh, or uh, well, biomarker degradation. Uh, you can freeze store samples also, but that's not uh, that relevant in clinical laboratory practice. But it's really a um, marker that is super robust. Phosphotau is also relatively robust and stable, so it's um, it is um, so. So I think what what we will see uh, it might, in Sweden it will happen very very soon, and in other parts of the world also uh, this combination of a phosphotau marker in plasma and neurofilament light in plasma, and that they are both measured when you have a patient with potential neurodegenerative disease. Great, thank you. I, I, I have a well, I have a couple more questions, if I may. Um, uh, and I, I was I was thinking about your comment about the complete separation, uh, Henrik, and I was thinking also about you know getting these things, these different markers used in the real world, and you know in the messy clinic and so forth, and and that you want to make decisions at the individual level uh, rather than the group level. Um, and um, 
uh, if you'll forgive me, in the Nature Medicine articles, I think you're referring to, I think it was Pete Tao. I, I, we, we could look look at them again, perhaps, but it, that, that's fine if not. I was struck by, I remember thinking that the distribution of points in, in some of the data where you've got controls, MCI, AD, I actually thought that whilst the MCI group uh, obviously hang together because they're within that diagnostic category, actually there was sort of a whole selection of points that were at the AD level and a whole load, probably more points, are down at the control level. And what do you think about that? Do you think that actually means that, you know, those people were, were in fact kind of, there was a bit of a split in that in that sort of data at the individual level? What do you think? Yep. I mean, if one divides them according to if they are amyloid uh, pet positive or not, one can definitely see if one has an MCI group, then one sees a split where the amyloid pet pe negative people have lower levels than the amyloid pet positive. But there is an overlap. So this is why I definitely think that what we likely will see is that we can pinpoint people who are clearly abnormal or clearly normal, but we might need to do some additional investigations on people who are close to the cut point. Um, another type of uh, scenario we are trying here to, to uh, model is if one instead could re-invite people who are close to the cut point, because those might be on their way to transitioning towards becoming positive or actually dropping down in their levels as well. Uh, and then a re, um, uh, that would work clinically, I think, also thinking about how other clinical chemistry tests are used. I mean, there are a few perfect clinical chemistry tests, as you, as you know. Um, so then if you are in the gray zone and then one could invite, the, uh, then that could be uh, communicated with the patient that uh, this is a result we're not uh, certain about. We would like to examine you more and we would like also to re-invite you for a follow-up investigation and then one does this again and then one could see if the patient is moving in any uh, particular direction. So that could be one way of handling this sticking to the blood test. The other way of course is to say okay we can't conclude here we do a PET. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah so this type of very practical way of using the biomarkers um, once we have very stable assays and um, uh, providers of kits that can guarantee longitudinal stability in, 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 uh, in the production lots, then, then I think this can be one practical way of handling the, the markers, give, using them almost like risk, risk indicator markers mm -hmm. rather than diagnostic tests. And is that is that longitudinal stability you referred to? Because actually we've been uh, dabbling with in in, in, this, in a in a research project in a, in a grant funded research project here in the UK with with some different markers, and it's been pointed out some issues around longitudinal stability and how you'd have to go back to the to the sample and re you know reassess. How does the, how do you think that affects the the, the, the sort of the, the utility of, of these things? I think it's definitely something one can plan for, much like. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking, for example, about chronic myeloid leukemia when a certain Philadelphia chromosome transcript was more used to monitor um, um, uh, treatment with, with uh, a, a really clever drug that did something to that specific transcript. Um, then uh, we in clinical chemistry kept samples and knew that we would get follow-up okay. samples. Right. So if we need to do this, it can definitely be arranged for. But I think we should actually do the, these studies um, now together as a field um, uh, to look at. It might also be, of course, that, you know, when thinking about the confounding factors that some people might have diseases that affect their, their uh, steady state levels of these proteins, perhaps yeah. one could instead see change over time as more indicative of, of pathology mm -hmm. than absolute level. Uh, this is uh, this has definitely not been proven yet, but I think this is something we should uh, uh, test in uh, in uh, studies. Um, if this could be one way forward, and um, it would again, it would work relatively well with a clinical scenario. If I knew that I have Alzheimer's in the family, and I go and give a blood sample at my GP's office every second year. And then I can, I know my stable phosphatau level, and then I see that oops, it starts to increase a little bit, and perhaps I will go back three to four, six months later, and then it is still up a little bit. But uh, it, I might not have crossed the threshold. It could still be an early indication of something going on. Again, it hasn't been proven, but it could be uh, the way we would um, 
see the markers. If that happens, I could then be referred to a memory clinic. Perhaps I would do a CSF or a, uh, or a PET, and then I could <laughs> be started on a treatment. And then I would see if the treatment lowers my phosphatase levels uh, again. And then, then one would know that this is um, this is uh, one way of monitoring detecting disease, monitoring the disease process, also in relation to a disease modifying treatment. Perhaps I could uh, be on a disease modifying treatment for one or two years and then reduce the dose a lot and then just check that my phosphatase levels does, don't start to increase again. And so, so hopefully the, this is what we will see in the future. Uh, I, I really hope it, this will come true, but um, of course I should I should be very objective and uh, falsify hypothesis and so, but if I would speculate about the future, I, I, I think that this is, uh, at least this is what we should see. We should test if this could be possible. I, I think it could be. And then this would be, again, we would be in a situation where we use advanced imaging technology on those patients who, were, who need it. And we would use um, uh, CSF on those patients where we perhaps also uh, think that there might be a risk that the patient has some neuroborreliosis or something else that is hard to detect in blood, but, but easy to detect in CSF. So one really would need to look at this as, have, as now we have access to additional tools. It's not like we are uh, excluding the tools we already have, but we have some more simple tools that could give us the possibility of focusing uh, the more advanced tools a little bit more on those uh, patients where it's needed, much like we work in uh, hepatology or cardiac, uh, cardiology or, or, or um, uh, asthma and diabetes and the other diseases. Yeah, I would also advocate that uh, MRI is a lot more accessible than PET scan. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So I think, I, I, you know, I hope people will use MRI um, to help to fill the gaps in, in knowledge as well. Uh, I'm, I mean, we're on probably almost out of time, Jed. You need have to tell me to stop, but I'm, I'm just really enjoying consideration of these issues. Um, one of the things that I was also thinking about is that in your descript in the flow chart that you put together, sort of thinking about how patients might flow through based on different marker combinations, amyloid. Um, I was wondering if you, if we could end up in a situation where we have a kind of amyloid reserve concern, or maybe interesting kind of line of research, which is. If amyloid is, 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 a, is a problem, do we assume that the neurodegeneration, whatever marker you might use, be it MRI or NFL or some combination and so forth, is that all therefore ascribed to the, to the amyloid uh, issue? And how do we deal with the, sort of the gap of understanding there? How do we sort of parcelate out the degree of degeneration or neurodegeneration coming from one aspect, maybe a comorbidity, and, and, and that which is related to the amyloid? Here, I actually hope that phosphatase and NFL in tandem or in parallel, I mean, would um, potentially work. But again, the studies are needed to address this specifically. But if one knows that a person is amyloid positive and negative for both phosphatase and neurofilament light, perhaps that is amyloid pathology one would be best not to touch. Again, very hypothetical. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps. Perhaps one could give such a person the advice that this is uh, it might this is really uh, this this is a common pathology. It doesn't seem to affect your neurons yet, but it 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 can do. And then we will follow uh, you and see if ever phosphatase and or NFL starts to increase. And then we start you on a treatment if that happens. Um, it could also be that you have people with amyloid pathology, negative phosphatase markers, but very high NFL. Then one again needs to look into non-Alzheimer's causes for the neurodegeneration. Uh, so, um, and perhaps such a per patient, <laughs> perhaps it's not an anti-amyloid antibody or an anti-amyloid treatment that patient needs the most. And perhaps that is a patient one also should try to identify in the clinical trials and perhaps do sub-analysis excluding mm. them mm. and see if that, but that, because that could be something else going on. And maybe, yeah, maybe a different drug treatment would be more suitable. That, exactly. One that we hope will come down the line. Thank you. Okay, well, th thank you again. I, I think we are just about out of time. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, if, if Stephen wants the last word or... Um, the other thing uh, to mention, I guess, is we're, we're very much looking forward to uh, ADPD and uh, hopefully some of us at least will, will be there in Gothenburg in person. Um, that, you are more than welcome. It's, this is my hometown. We look forward to seeing you there. Good. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.